Hello and welcome to today's event, uh, our Fish for Thought on International Women's Day um, is on gender inclusive innovations for food system transformation. As we wait for more colleagues to join the event, um, I will, I'm Doina Huso and I will be moderating this, this event. Um, we will be waiting a few more seconds so that we have everyone joining us. Uh, today we celebrate International Women's Day and highlight the gender inclusive innovations that empower and ensure food, nutrition and income opportunities for women in aquatic food systems. We will focus mostly on World Fish's research and work in designing and implementing gender inclusive innovations in response to climate and COVID-19 impacts. During the discussion, our panel of experts will share regional innovations in aquatic food systems to increase the visibility, agency and leadership capabilities of women in small scale artisanal fisheries and aquaculture sectors across Asia, Africa and the Pacific. I'm here joined by our group of experts, starting with Shakuntala Thilsted, our global lead in nutrition and public health, but also the winner of uh, last year's World Food Prize. I'm joined also by Rama Adam, our other experts. I'm joined by Rumana Perzadi Hussain, our expert in climate change research and um, based in Bangladesh. Also by Anouk Wright. Um, Anouk, she's our social scientist and she's based in Solomon Islands. I'm joined by Arifur Rahman. He's one of our research uh, associates at World Fish in Bangladesh, working at the Ecofish project and by FAO's Nicole Franz. So before we start this event today, I would like to go through the, the housekeeping rules. All of you will be muted and there is a Q&A pane for the questions that will come in during our Q&A session. So please put your questions in the Q&A box or your comments in the chat box. And um, for the ones that could not attend today, we will be sharing our event recording and all the presentations and materials that we will be presenting today. So without further ado, I will give the floor to our first speaker, our Global Lead for Nutrition and Public Health, Shakuntala Thilstad. Shakuntala, over to you. Thank you so much, Doinu, and greetings to all. At World Fish, with our colleagues, partners, and friends, we always look forward to celebrating International Women's Day, as we are doing this year, to be able to hold events, and as we are doing today, a virtual one. We take this opportunity to celebrate the work that our researchers are engaged in with communities, women, and men, and their families. Four of our talented young researchers will assist us today to celebrate this International Women's Day 2022. We will hear about their research, examples of gender sensitive innovations for aquatic food system transformation. Gender sensitive innovations for aquatic food system transformation is central to the work we do at World Fish and for the implementation of the World Fish strategy up to 2030, aquatic foods for nourishing people and nourishing our planet. It is wonderful that this event today, our researchers will present innovations which span some of the regions and countries in which we work, Sub-Saharan Africa, Solomon Islands and Bangladesh. At the same time, we do have many more exciting examples of gender sensitive innovations for aquatic food systems transformation from many other countries and communities. Please do visit the World Fish website and learn about the work we are engaged in 
on gender sensitive innovations. For example, work we have in India, Odisha and Assam, in Timor-Leste and in Nigeria and Egypt. Our event today is extremely opportune, taking into consideration the leaps and bounds we have made with transformation of food systems with aquatic foods in just the last few years. In the global agenda of the United Nations Food Systems Summit 2021, it became very clear that transformation of food systems for meeting the needs of all people cannot take place without the inclusion of diverse aquatic foods. In heralding the, the UN Food Systems Summit as the People's Summit, it was very apparent that inclusion of aquatic food systems is central to many people across the globe women, youth, and indigenous people who are dependent on aquatic food systems for their livelihoods, their income, nutrition, and health. Indeed, the scientific group of the UN Food Systems Summit identified sustaining aquatic foods as one of the seven priorities to end hunger and protect our planet. Also, in May 2021, UN Nutrition released its first discussion paper on the role of aquatic foods in sustainable healthy diets. This paper highlights the diversity of aquatic foods, animals, plants, and microorganisms, and presents concrete solution of aquatic food systems to be undertaken at global, national, and community level. The decade of action on nutrition and the decade of ocean science for sustainable development, which was launched last year, also present many opportunities for embracing gender sensitive innovations for aquatic food systems transformation and for nourishing all people and our planet. I look forward to hearing today from my colleague, Nicole Franz from FAO and about the very many opportunities that the International Year of Aquatic Fisheries and Aquaculture, EAFA 2022 offers for implementing solutions for gender sensitive innovations for aquatic food systems transformation. Thank you all very much for joining us today to celebrate the International Women's Day 2022. Let me pass back the virtual floor to my colleague and our moderator, Doina Husso. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shakuntala. We will now start the presentations from the world fish experts. Um, today, we'll have Rama Dam, the social inclusion and market scientist, talk about the gender inclusion in aquatic food systems globally and specifically giving some examples from um, Africa. So uh, over to you, Rama. So uh, my, 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 my topic today, basically I'm gonna provide a good, good summary of the gender and social inclusion in aquatic food systems. What World Fish and its partners have been able to do in the past four to five years, what progress have we been able to see and insights across the globe? So this is just a snapshot of what we have been able to do globally. So I think because our audiences, we have varied audiences, it's important I provide a rationale of, um, for gender and social inclusion, like why should we really care about this thematic area? And what are the four pathways or ways um, we can, we, journeys that we can use in order to um, achieve women's empowerment and gender equality, lessons that we have learned from World Fish and the partners. And lastly, I'm going to share a slide um, providing you the tools that World Fish and its partners have developed over the past four to five years that, um, that one can use to address gender inclusive and gender responsive research for development. 
So why should we care? Again, I think it's really important to know that gender equality and women's empowerment are globally recognized priorities. So this is not only for world fish, but across the globe, as it has already been stipulated with the UN Sustainable Development Goal number five, which is, just, which is achieving gender equality and empowering women and young girls, talks um, heavily about the need to, uh, to unpack and address the inequalities. And uh, for us uh, in this sector, the fish and agri-food system are intersected with macroeconomic and socioeconomic uh, patterns, as well as the micro uh, of gender inequalities and inequities. And this can be seen with the workload burden that women um, have to endure at home, which are usually unpaid. And also um, where the women are situated within the whole value chain, whether it's small scale fisheries or aquaculture, they are usually find at the nodes of the value chain that are, have, uh, that, that are less lucrative or provide minimal profit as compared to where men are. And also it's important to know that uh, within the regions that we work, Asia, Africa, the Pacific, and poverty is, it disproportionately affects women. And, um, and for us, there is a need to understand what do men prefer, what do women prefer when it comes to the technologies or innovations that we have developed? What are their needs? What are their wants? And how can we meet their needs? So um, when we focus on the pathway one, the, the journey for pathway one, which is um, resilience, of um, aquatic food system in order for us to achieve the gender inclusive and responsive innovation. The key message here that we really wanna be able to, uh, to, to answer or tackle is addressing the issue of um, gender blind innovation. So we want the innovations that we are creating to be gender aware and to be coming specifically from the small scale fishers or aquaculture uh, value chain actors, you know, the top down innovation um, so that we don't continue to perpetuate the gender gaps that we see in terms of um, uh, accessing to resources, decision making within the household and beyond, among others, and, and be able to bridge that gap so that opportunities that are there within this sector are benefiting men and women. Um, equally. So there are several innovations, but for the purpose of this um, presentation, I've just put only two here that we, 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 we have been able to do, but there are several that we can share during the discussion. And the first one is using climate smart aquaculture approach um, in Bangladesh. So will fish engage women? And in, in, this part, uh, in this part of our study, we wanted women not to be like a passive bystander, but to be active participant of the research in, you know, enrolling them in fish farmer schools and for them to be able to provide ideas in terms of what types of fish are, uh, are resilient or, you know, robust, they can withstand the climate that's there in Bangladesh and um, the local fish feeds that are, that are ch cheap, that they can afford and use uh, without uh, much hindrance. And from this um, intervention, what we were able to find is we saw that women um, having that knowledge and uh, being able to access inputs and it, it increased their income because then they were able to, you know, to pr produce a good amount of fish and sell, which at the end of the day, at the end of the study, when we evaluated 70%, 75% of these women reported positive changes into their household decision-making power. Another intervention, um, or in another innovation, sorry, is, is the work that we have been doing in several countries, not only in Bangladesh, but we have done it in Egypt, in Zambia, and in India. And here we were trying to understand what are the, the differences or similarities um, with regards to the preferences of fish trades that, are, that World Fish uh, um, has developed and their partners. And what we found that, what we have found is that in India and Bangladesh, women and men had shared interests. You know, there was some overlap in terms of the fish size, growth and appearance and taste. But in most of these um, 
countries, women more often prioritize traits that are relating to household food and nutrition security needs. And men, um, they, they really cared a lot about market-related characteristics like price. They wanted the big fish. And um, another journey or another pathway route for us to be able to um, achieve um, empowerment is the issue of inclusive livelihoods so that women can be empowered and, um, and, and uh, be able to have a voice into what they're doing. And the key message for this pathway is that um, gender gaps and underlying gender barriers um, are persistent in and along the value chain. Um, and we, but we wanna try to tackle that. And the, the, one of the innovations that we have done in the past few years is um, to try to address the issue of um, finance access, you know, gender inclusive finance. And at the same time, bundling it up with uh, providing post-harvest technologies that are uh, environmentally friendly and healthy for the women and men. So in Malawi, um, in Malawi, we worked with women and, and men fish processors. They were introduced into, into solar tent dryers um, and improved smoking kilns, among others. And they are connected to a bank. And uh, we, we worked with the bank so that they were able to provide lower interest rates uh, for, for women compared to men. And also, you know, make the women to be in a group so that there's that social collateral and making sure that you know the finance goes directly to the supplier of that uh, tent or smoking kennel or the inputs that is that is needed, and we have seen um, a remarkable um, improvement in terms of use of these technologies. Innovation two is um, looking at closing the digital divide using the information communication and technology, cell phones, and. Um, so wh why is this important? This is really important, especially for, for, for society, when we want to address social norms. For example, actually, this was done in Bangladesh, in the coastal areas where they do small-scale fishery. So they have a ban for three months where, you know, small-scale fishers are not allowed to, to, to harvest. And during this time, then the, it, it hampers the livelihoods, economic sustainability of that place. And we what we what we did is we, Get, we got the women in, in groups to knit pebbles, uh, as you can see in the photo there, which were um, collected in, in, in a group and sold overseas. And this resulted in, um, in, in, in a revenue of uh, close to 20,000 US dollars during that uh, short period of time. So again, improve their livelihoods. And the pathway number three, this is inclusive governance, uh, in, in especially in small scale fisheries. How can we make sure that um, the, 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 the resources there, women are able to also participate and share their views and get at that chair and say what needs to be said. So first of all, the, the, we, we, all, we want, in order to, the, the key message that I wanna share with you is that there are persistent gender and social exclusions in this sector from an inter-community to global scales. And uh, one of the best way to address this is um, through, um, through making sure that we have the data needed that will speak where are women involved, where are men involved, uh, what are the bottlenecks that are there, to be able to document it really properly so that we can be able to go to the policy level and say, this is what we are seeing. So the solution number one, World Fish and with, with FAO and other partners work on a project on illuminating hidden harvest where um, 17 countries were selected and they were able to basically collect sex disaggregated data so that we could be able to unpack those issues and, and unpack the issues of that invisibility of the women and being sent only men as fishers. And the solution number two is empowering women as leaders eh, in household communities and businesses. We have done this in Cambodia and Feed, Feed the Future program. Um, women were empowered and they were able to take a good seat at those committees. And through this, they were able to increase their fund, uh, fundraising and be able to share their needs in, in using those resources. Lastly is the gender transformative approaches to overcome those invisible barriers of, of gender inequality or gender norms. And um, the key message here is constraining gender norms perpetuate gender inequalities. Wellfish has done tremendous amount of work 
in the gender transformative approaches um, in this area. And, and one of the um, key partnerships that I want to highlight in this meeting is the work that we have done with the Catholic Relief Services in Zambia. And through that work, because wolfish cannot be everywhere, but um, gaining that knowledge, the Catholic Relief Services, they've been able to scale our gender transformative approaches, tools, and and kit on savings and groups into nine countries, eight countries in Africa and one country in Central Africa, which is Guatemala. Um, and then, so the key thing is, okay, now you've told us about all these pathways, how can we go about them? There are tools that are available that World Fish and its partners have worked to, to generate them. And that can be used not only by researchers, but also development practitioners and students um, and uh, government. So there are tools for gender inclusive and gender responsive renovation, tools for inclusive livelihoods and wealth generation, inclusive governance, and the gender transformative approaches. They are available online and you can reach us out for that. Thank you very much. Now um, I will pass over this to Sean, who's gonna share with us um, a video about small scale fisheries uh, of you know, women in Africa and the impact that COVID-19 has, um, basically. Good morning. Hello, good afternoon. Hi, ladies. Good morning, ladies. Um, my name is Malita Shikweja. Justina Ogenovu Bikila from Delta State. My name is Dola Chinamba. My name is Fatuma. So this fish where they sell, so I take care of me picking them for me the able go school for me feature tomorrow because not to so no my get for lesson time can kaki tie an arm for go na market for go buy fish but if if me picking them land me back join me, me no sin God make her succeed and this is done the the better for me tomorrow. I know your family so by this school where they go and I make her sell this fish here. Yeah. For me, I able to pay my school fees. So I make her sell this fish, I'm able to continue my school. Man, I don't see that, I remember, I say, able for me, no. And for me, no, I'm always not in the car last, so you see. very much Rama um, and thank you Sean for sharing that video we will be we will have shared um, the full video in the chat box so you can see the film now let me pass the floor to our second presenter uh, Prezadi Romana Hussein uh, hi Romana hi Donna hi the floor is over to you so thank you again Donna, and good, af good afternoon uh, from dhaka to all who are watching and are listening to us uh, i will be presenting our experiences on developing climate information services for aquaculture in bangladesh to manage climate risks and also how this uh, innovative approach of uh, reducing climate risks can empower women uh, in the context of the country so we all know that Bangladesh is a highly vulnerable country to climate change, variability, and also to extremes. And uh, seasonal um, signature of extreme heat, heavy and mean precipitation changes, floods and cyclones are few among the challenges. And these are having impacts on aquaculture operations and creating risks for fish farmers in this deltaic region. For instance, during summer, high temperatures exceed the physiological tolerance level of aquatic plants, animals, and microorganisms. Sudden temperature fluctuations lead to mortality. Dry and cold spells trigger disease outbreaks, and erratic or intense rainfall events cause harvest losses. 
So to reduce uh, these climate-induced risks in day-to-day -day aquaculture operations, we jointly with our uh, partners, uh, after having dialogues uh, uh, with different value chain actors, developed a decision support system uh, for communicating site-specific climate information and accordingly providing services. And this project was supported by CGIAR Research Program on Climate Change Agriculture and uh, Food Security. And the concept was uh, providing access to high quality climate information and uh, context specific uh, services tailored to the needs of the aquatic food system so that aquatic food producers could be empowered to adapt and manage climate risks and thus offset climate impacts. So initially we developed the decision support system with a five day lead time on a decision framework uh, uh, targeting temperature and rainfall thresholds and that is able to trigger advisories for a particular rainfall or uh, uh, temperature condition identified for a particular fish species. Meanwhile, we, we have also explored that uh, developing a seasonal climate services with one month lead time uh, can also be useful because seasonal uh, forecasts uh, can provide information on when to start pond preparation to decide on particular period for fingerling stocking uh, to make decision um, on production volume and also adjusting maintenance and harvesting schedule. Uh, so we are uh, scaling this knowledge to, to the Northwestern drought prone region of the country through our uh, BMGF funded uh, idea project platform. The project has a Facebook uh, farmers group of around uh, 10,000 active fish farmers um, of which 11% are women and live Q&A sessions on a wide range of information and services are arranged every week along with uh, sharing the video contents. So to make this digital solution self-sustainable and also to reach a very large scale, uh, we are aiming to develop networks with the active participation of private entrepreneurs uh, and large private companies. We also disseminated uh, climate information services to the state of uh, Odisha in India through Reliance Foundation Information Service Platform and the mobile-based audio and text advisories on fingerling stocking, fish, uh, pond, feed, and disease management uh, uh, decisions or advisories were sent to around uh, 50,000 fish farmers uh, through their WhatsApp group uh, during adverse winter and monsoon weather conditions. And we are also, uh, we have also started working in Zambia to develop such climate information services in context of the region as well. So we, we recognize this uh, innovative approach of providing information and services uh, as gender inclusive innovation in the light of uh, climate risks to manage. And this is because women's engagement in uh, supplementary or secondary uh, fish farming activities uh, in, in the in context of Bangladesh uh, results not only in restricted involvement in day-to-day -day aquaculture operations, but also restricted decision-making roles so far. Therefore, uh, if we can provide risk reduction information and services using such innovative uh, digital approach to our women actors, and simultaneously, if we can ensure their access to such decision support system, I believe that it will substantially promote uh, women actors' involvement in regular management decisions, strengthen their voice in decision-making role, and also enhance their climate uh, resilience capacity. At the, at the very end, I'd like to uh, say that uh, uh, having, uh, I mean, enhancing uh, this climate information services for women uh, actors is also critical in achieving broader goals of food, nutrition, and livelihood security, as well as sustainability targets uh, of climate action goals. So you can have a look uh, at our relevant publications. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to stop here. Uh, thank you all. Um, going back to Doina. Thank you, Romana, for the great presentation. And um, we will be Moving on to our next presenter, Anouk Rai. She's a social scientist based in the Solomon Islands. And um, hi, Anouk. Hi, Joanna. And thanks for the introductions and, and informative sessions so far. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Or oh, shall we play the video first? Yes. Before we yes. continue with your presentation, we will have a short video on Follow the Fish.
thank you for the video, uh, Sean, and we move on to Anouk's presentation. We talk today about um, what um, Rama was referring to earlier, which is uh, the inclusive governance strain of the work that we do at Wildfish. Um, as been mentioned, I'm based in Solomon Islands, and uh, but work on a project that's funded by ACR um, and works across three countries in the Pacific um, to spread inclusive governance and community-based fisheries management. So this is a, just a quick snapshot of our teams in the three different countries. Um, as myself and the team are from Solomon Islands visiting a community on the left-hand side, uh, my colleagues from Vanuatu on the right, and my colleagues from uh, Kiribati um, at the lower part of the screen. So what I'm presenting today is really a group effort um, involving many faces and places. We work most closely with our local and national governments in these three countries. So as you were seeing from the video, um, there's problems with gender inequity in the Pacific um, and, it's, and specific problems with gender inequity in relation to fisheries. So our approach to handle these um, issues was to develop a participat a participatory action research um, to encourage participation to develop action plans at the community level. And this also has an effect on the provincial level and the national level too. Um, we use generally indigenous uh, methods of research. So a particular focus on oral storytelling and local ways of discussion. And how do we talk about gender in those local ways of discussion? Um, another sort of specific feature that you also find in other cultures is most of the decisions, um, there is a preference for consensus-based decisions too. So we work on the, on the basis of these three elements. Um, you'll see on the right-hand side, um, we developed the work of Agarwal and Danica Kleber and others to look at the different steps of inclusion. So we go beyond women's attendance at meetings to actually having women really valued and part of the plans, part of the community-based um, fisheries management plans. We want to see women's views and needs reflected in there. So we're working on these steps of inclusion um, to try and increase women through an active um, facilitation approach. Um, so this is an example of the trip report um, that we use, the, the template we use on all our trips. So before we go out to communities, we think about these issues and we also report back on them. Um, so there's some gender sensitive facilitation methods we use. Um, I won't go into them in great detail because there are publications available um, where you can look at, look at these things and also um, look at the ones that were more tricky for us, the ones that we still have problems with. Um, but in general, we try to have opportunities for women to meet on their own prior to uh, meeting with the full community um, and, and some other ways like allowing children in the meeting um, and, and um, having some sort of just small things that you can do as a facilitator to encourage women to participate. Okay, so what we do, so what I'm going to talk about today specifically is the review of fisheries management plans that each coastal community um, or many coastal communities have um, in the Pacific. So we had separate discussions with women, men and youth. Um, and we also had women, men and youth facilitators to talk about how the plan's going, who is included, who is left out um, and how communities would like to see their management of their fisheries improved. Um, we used the fish analogy um, to talk through the different elements of the um, plans. So we talked about the tail of the fish being the community committee that steers the fish in a certain direction, um, steers the management of fisheries in a certain direction. Um, the scales, which are, of course, the rules um, in each management plan. Um, the currents that are things like often very common natural disasters in the Pacific um, that might change the plan over time, things that we can't control. And also, of course, the teeth, the enforcement of the um, fisheries management plan and who's involved with the teeth. And that's um, particularly an interesting part for gender because there are norms um, of men being involved in security. So how do we engage those norms in discussion to um, also open it up for women? So we went out to a number of communities. Um, there were 77 workshops in total and 20 communities across the three different countries. Um, and in those communities, we had those different groups, women, uh, men, and youth. Yeah, so you'll see those in the different parts. Um, so 
what we so this is an example of how the practice works the participatory action process practice works in communities so we have um jill she's a, a community facilitator from malaita province she's holding the piece of paper and asking questions to the youth about what they want in their management plan whether it's working from the opinion of um, male and female youth in the community um, in Malaita and Solomons. Okay, so then the youth present back using the drawing of the fish, um, what they would like to see, how they would like to change the rules, how they would like to change the composition of the committee and how the committee works, um, what they think would work better for enforcement of the community-based fisheries management plans um, and other issues that they've come up with. So this is a group of the youth. Um, they nominated a female to speak on their behalf. Um, and she's presenting back the ideas to the chiefs in the community and the women leaders in the community. Okay, so in the, this particular example, um, one of the ideas that the youth came up with was they said the fisheries management plan is just focused on fish and other aquatic foods, um, but it hasn't dealt with the fact that people collect coral um, for building materials and other reasons in the communities. And the, the cutting down and collection of coral is actually influencing the sustainability of the um, fishery. So they've suggested a rule here to not collect coral um, in the management area. Um, there's also, they've also nominated that there weren't any youth actually formally represented on the fisheries committee in the community, um, and that should be um, taken care of. And then they had a detailed plan about who should be on the committee. Um, so they wanted to add female youth and also church representatives and also youth that were sort of excluded, yeah, not in church or not in school. Um, and so all of these ideas were then adopted by the full um, community and incorporated into um, the fisheries management plan. So we found out that women, youth and men's inputs have been included mostly in final action plans, not all, but uh, the majority. Um, and that the process of participatory action actually um, gave the groups a chance to share and have their ideas valued and um, discussed when it came to decision-making. So we moved the needle a little bit from women and youth maybe attending meetings to sharing their ideas and being involved in the final plan um, in our steps of inclusion. So this, this last quarter of the, the scale of, of inclusion, if we can think of it. Um, one thing we did find too, though, is that the needs and representation of people with disabilities is almost absent in communities. And this is something we're hoping to tackle um, in the next um, three years um, as part of the Pathways project that we're working on. Um, and this is a new field too for us to think more about and actually do more research about because data is very lacking. Um, and we're looking to, to follow up about what are the transformative impacts from running this kind of a process in communities. Um, so far, it's seemed to demonstrate that the communities and facilitators have a better idea of how to do inclusion and decision making, um, going beyond an attendance list to actually involving people in uh, more fully in discussions and decisions. Um, and we've also noticed a nomination of more women and youth in the committee, but uh, men are still in the majority. So there's still gender-based norms about leadership um, and fisheries that, you know, we need more um, action to tackle. Um, this is just some links to myself and my other gender colleague here in the Solomons and some tools if you want to follow up more about these resources. And I'll hand back to you, Duena. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anouk. Lovely presentation. And uh, we will be sharing all these materials uh, with the attendees after uh, this event, we will be sending out an email wrapping up um, today's event recording as well as presentations. So uh, please make sure you subscribe to our newsletter so you can receive all those materials. And now I will move on to our last presenter. His name is Muhammad Arifur Rahman. Um, he's coming from Bangladesh. Um, he's a res research associate with the Ecofish project, and he will be talking today about uh, women-led uh, technologies and um, more specifically seaweed farming and green mussels farming in Bangladesh. And over to you, Arif. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hi. Hello, so hello everybody and uh, happy Women's Day to all and respective audience. I'm Arifur Rahman from Ecofish Project of Wildfish Bangladesh, led by uh, Professor Dr. Abdul Wahab, sir. 
Uh, I'm going to discuss on Fisher's women lead climate resilient technologies for enhancing aquatic food production in calm nutrition and women led small business in Bangladesh. Here, our Ecofish 2 project goal is to improve the resilience of the coastal fisheries to secure equitable food, nutrition, and income benefits uh, for small scale fishers communities and artisanal fishing communities of Bangladesh. And uh, we introduced seaweed farming, green mussel farming, and uh, safe dry fish production from marine pelagic small fish. Uh, as alternative income generating activities and livelihood improvement. Here is seaweed farming. We introduced our project introduced seaweed farming that is easy to culture, require no inputs and short culture cycle. That is, uh, it is very economic, uh, environment friendly. And also we can harvest, our beneficiary can harvest it within uh, twice per month, uh, depending on the species. And it's highly nutritious and it has high demand and diversified utilization as salad, soups, uh, uh, some industrial products. And also it support the, uh, the system support food and shelters to marine fish juveniles. And it's a, a great opportunity to introduce as alternative income and employment opportunity for the fishing communities, fishers, women, and also youths in the fishing community. And definitely it's uh, reduce carbon dioxide from the ocean and uh, uh, and reduce uh, the temperature from the sea surface and also it controls eutrophication by absorbing nutrition excess nutrition from the sea so what ecofish did fishers women led seaweed farming introduced trained 400 fishers where 50 percent were women in cox's Bazar for seaweed farming and provided supports for seaweed farming that's some materials for seaweed site establishments, three different types of systems developed and practicing by our beneficiaries, that is off bottom long line, off bottom and uh, net and floating long line. And also women works in culture system management processing that is drying, washing, sorting, cleaning, and also marketing in local markets. And then our, we, involved our fishers women and also we are trying to market linkage, create market linkage and entrepreneurship development in progress and involved young women researchers from university as part of involving or increasing number of uh, women research, young women researchers in natural resource management and conservation. And then I am going to talk about green muscle farming. Our green muscle farming is also similar to seaweed farming, it's nature-based culture and no need uh, feed inputs or require very less labor. And the farming system also supports biodiversity of organisms and the huge abundance of spats in nature in basically in Bangladesh, in Cox's Bazar, Mohishkali Channel, Shahapuridip and other places, use natural spats that uh, those need uh, structures for attachment and alternative income and employment opportunity for fishing communities. Ecofish uh, project involved fishers women in green mussel farming also as a climate resilient technology. Uh, trained 200 uh, farmers where 50% are women and supports for green mussel system provided also uh, uh, in three systems, uh, mostly raft culture. And in raft, we introduced a rope, gaze and net culture. And market linkage entrepreneurship development is uh, already developed with uh, private sectors and some local restaurants involved young women researchers as well. You see that one uh, university uh, student from Sibashu, she is monitoring growth in our sites at Mahishkali channel. So then we are marine, small, marine pelagic small fish drying to produce safe dry fish production is another intervention from Ecofish project to improve the livelihood status uh, of the fishing communities. So why marine pelagic small fish, uh, ecofish focusing? Because it needs very small space for drying and less time as well. And uh, it, it used low price of raw materials, uh, pelagic small fish. Uh, pelagic small fish are highly nutritious and provide nutrition to fishers family. Uh, fishing community or fishers women can produce uh, value added products such as dried powder, chutney, pickles, or other uh, products from this small pelagic fish. And also it is a very, uh, an excellent window for alternative income and employment opportunity for fishing communities. Uh, from our Ecofish project, we 
uh, branded the small pelagic fish and also uh, pelagic small fish and also we distributed 2500 kg pelagic small fish dried fish to 2500 fishers household uh, during the fishing ban period as food ration so we involved fishers women in uh, drying marine pelagic small fish and to produce safe dry fish and trained 1,000 fishers women already in Cox's Bazar and Bhola and provided support for bamboo trellis preparation to produce safe dry fish. Distributed, we also distributed uh, marine, very fresh marine pelagic small fish, more than 40 kg per households and frequent visit to motivate and change behavior. As you know that fish drying is very traditional in Bangladesh and since and times, times it's very traditional. So it's difficult to change human behavior and as part of the behavior change, our EcoFish project, uh, we regularly monitor, visit, and encourage them to produce safe dry fish and good quality dry fish so they can get very good price uh, by selling those products. And market link is an entrepreneurship development for uh, good price ensuring. Fishers women now make safe dry fish uh, and also fish powder and other products from uh, small uh, pelagic small fish like anchovy and sardine. So what are the key outcomes of the project interventions? Here is a boat with a grassilaria uh, that is red seaweed that harvested from our uh, culture site at uh, Rastarpara Kurushkul, that is Moheshkali Channel. So key outcomes of the uh, ecofish two interventions are improved economic empowerment Women contribute to family income, thus improved livelihood, increased social networks and social capital of fishers women. Income of fishing households increased uh, uh, because now fishers and his uh, wife or fishing uh, community women also contributing to their family. Women-led business established on seaweed selling, green mussel selling, and also uh, dry fish selling. Women support family during the ban period and pandemic. Uh, through their extra income by selling those foods and improved skills and knowledge through training and uh, culture system development and in situ uh, trial of the uh, systems and women culture seed green muscle and produce safe dry fish now they do climate resilient income activities from the climate resilient technologies women have knowledge on marine resource conservation in the training and in our regular visit we regularly encourage them and also we inform them uh, how to conserve our marine resources, what is climate change, what type of adaptive measures we should take. So they have now knowledge on climate change and marine resource conservation. Trash fish is utilized, that is um, through drying of marine pelagic small fish, which is, which is considered as trash fish. Uh, now trash fish is converted into cash fish by fishers women. So now they can earn by selling and dr by drying and selling those fishes. And women produce diversified processed food. That is uh, also those uh, trash fish also converted to oh, safe and hygienic and nutritious uh, processed food. And now improved relationships and norms. Uh, so through interventions, livelihood status of the family improved, increased socioeconomic status of fishers women in the community. Women get access to market through market linkages um, by the project. Fishers women become role model to their neighbors that they can earn from by selling seaweed and dry fish, green mussels. So more women getting encouragement from them. Gender-based violence reduced uh, in the community. And also here is the story of a seaweed beneficiary, Anwara, who now can earn by selling seaweed uh, in the market. And uh, she also, gave, in this season, she sold more than 2,000 kg raw seaweed and more than 200 kg dry seaweed. Um, in the market and uh, thanks to all thanks to the audience and uh, thanks to my team leader who nominated me for this uh, session now i am passing back the floor to uh, our honorable moderator diana over to you thank you thank you arif um great presentation and really um interesting examples coming from bangladesh and um now we will move on to our Q&A session. We have some questions from our audience already in. Um, I will start with uh, a question from Mr. Mohammed Mozam Khan. Um, he's asking that 
in many countries, mostly Muslim countries, such as Pakistan, Islamic Republic of Iran, Saudi Arabia, Persian Gulf countries, Oman and Yemen, etc. Women are not at all involved in fisheries, including nutrition and socioeconomic aspects of it. What can be done in these countries? Any possibilities of starting their use in some household activities? Uh, we gave um, great examples from Bangladesh. So I would invite uh, Rumana and Arif as representatives of Bangladesh, also a country who is predominantly Muslim to kind of um, answer that question. And also Rama. So who wants to start? Maybe Rumana or Arif and then... Yeah, uh, yeah. Diana, can I respond a bit? Uh, yeah, for I, I think we need to create effective uh, communicating messages uh, for uh, for yeah uh, to start these initiatives in in those Muslim countries as well, and uh, and we also need to emphasize on on the impact evaluations uh, in which countries we have already uh, did this new uh, uh, innovative approaches and what type of impact we had. And so, so that we can uh, effectively communicate those messages. Uh, yeah, so that, that's my quick response, Donna. Thank you. Thank you, Romana. Um, Rama, you can take this question as well. Yes, um, actually, this reminds me for what we are doing in the IDEA project, which is funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, in Bangladesh, in Northwestern Bangladesh. And what we are doing right now, we are doing gender transformative approaches. We have forum theaters. So we have found uh, a professional company that is going around 60 communities in the Northwestern Bangladesh in Rangpu and Rajshahi, basically with skits, messages on um, how women can be involved in aquaculture uh, and also how to reduce the labor burden for women um, when they are involved in aquaculture at the same time in the household, why is it important for them to be involved in aquaculture in terms of financial aspects and improving nutrition and household uh, income. So these are, you know, these are approaches. So going from community to community with kids involving people in the local market to really see what this can be done and spotlighting uh, successful local women service providers in the agriculture who have, you know, their agro dealer shops, uh, who are selling these gill nets, who are selling the inputs uh, that, you know, this can be done. And we also have a Facebook platform that we provide, you know, we have provided several video short messages and communication messages showing that, you know, there are women who are participating in this sector and not only in the, in the lower nodes of the value chain, but even in the higher notes like the hatchery hatchery sector so yeah this is these are one of the ways uh, because when they see it they will believe that this can be done Thank are you. if we can get uh, an answer from you as well uh, uh yes donna so what i would like to say that uh, it's very important to uh, motivate the community is very important and economic empowerment of women is uh, really important to solve such issues and uh, what it is did you see uh, that Ecofish uh, involved so many fishers women. That's a lot. And also Ecofish has another intervention like community savings group through fishers women, that women will save uh, the money. I will talk about this later also. So uh, if the women don't involve with aquaculture or fisheries, and also they don't join with the community, then half of the community is totally absent. So. Uh, we have to uh, provide examples from Bangladesh. We can give examples from other countries and uh, throw example and setting example in the community. I think we can do something for those countries where it's really, really difficult. And you know that, yes, some places it will be very challenging. Some places it will be very easy. So we have to take all challenges and we have to solve all those. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arif. And we move on to the next question. What can we do to scale up and finance gender inclusive innovations in aquatic food systems? And um, I will start uh, with Rama, if you can highlight some solutions yeah. and ways. 
Yeah, so I think this is a very important question, Doina, for all of us to, to think about. Um, each country, each region is very context specific. Um, so we cannot take the approach that we have done in Malawi and say we're gonna, it's, gonna, it's going to work in Bangladesh or it's going to work in Egypt. So first of all, we really need to sit down and investigate what works for each of these specific uh, region, be it East Africa. And in, in terms of that, then we can look at, you know, projects that have been done with World Fish, projects that have been done with other actors like Messi Corps or Oxfam that, that, that work, that also work in these areas. And what was, you know, what were the key elements that made them to be successful? How did they engage with these financial service providers? What were the terms um, of engagement? And what were the repayment agreement? And how did it work? What were the bottlenecks? And once we have, you know, zoned in at specifically what, what has worked for, for in those different projects or programs, then we can start engaging uh, we, we at the macro level, you know, the, the policy actors in those countries and say, oh, this is what is working now. And we want to make sure that our women, you know, are, are bankable. Our women can get the finance that they need in order to, to, to get the technologies for fish processing or to, to be involved in hatcheries to, to get the needed knowledge. And um, so it, 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 it is very context specific. And once, once we, 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 we showcase and we are able to really uh, see, you know, see in numbers that, you know, this is, these are the number of beneficiaries that we have touched, then we can, I think we can move very quickly with, with the, in the policy, um, you know, discussion with the government actors in this sector and be able to, for them to even, uh, you know, uh, establish rules with the banks that, you know, for these, when you are working with smallholder uh, fishery people or smallholder farmers with agricultural um, sector or women in, in the agricultural business value chains, you know, th these are the terms we want you to engage with and agree with those terms so it, it needs to start from the ground and we go up rather than up and then down yeah thank you rama a uh, great points and i would like to have uh, anouk's uh, take on this question as well thank you joanna and rama um in the pacific really uh in terms of scaling up inclusion, it's a complicated problem because we have um, exclusion of women in fisheries per se, like there are some areas of the sea where they will say these are men's areas. Um, only men should, for example, work on tuna fishery boats. Um, we also have exclusion, uh, which is related to governance. So most of the political leaders in the Pacific are men. Um, and then we have the sort of invisibility of the women who do fish. Um, so, for example, in Solomon Islands, like 50% of all the catch um, that's caught and sold or eaten at the village level, the rural level, is, is caught by women. But often when you have governments or you have like a new donor come into the country and they want to talk about fisheries, they will only talk to the men and they will assume that all fishermen are men. So in terms of scaling, even like research and information to point out the huge role that women do have in fisheries, um, that we're not just talking about fish species, that we're also talking about seaweeds, um, about shellfish, which, you know, women are more involved in this kind of inshore um, collection and harvests. Even spreading that information out can be important in um, sort of scaling up inclusion. But then I think too, like the point of our presentation today was that there is no substitute for spending the time to work with communities, particularly in the Pacific, because we have indigenous cultures and high degrees of diversity. So we can do things at the national level and the provincial level, but they may not make sense at the local level. And we need to actually have discussions um, about gender inequity at the local level too. Um, so I think what we're trying to do now is to yeah, facilitate those discussions at the local level, but also um, encourage transformative change through our government colleagues um, so they're more aware of gender prior to doing things with communities and prior to making policy decisions, um, that they can also incorporate the, the voices of women, the political leaders we have who are women, um, the women's networks, groups, the collection, the collective action of women, um, incorporating that into government decision making as well. 
So we're looking at all levels from local, provincial to national, um, and also regional because Pacific is a region of um, many small nations. Um, and so therefore the role of regional policy is, is, uh, is great because we often do um, identify priorities at the regional level um, and also sort of track those priorities at the regional level as well. So I think World Fish has a, a big role to play with others, with the governments and the NGOs in using information and research um, to highlight the role of women in fisheries and also to elevate that role in the various different um, levels where we work. Thank you, Anung. That was a very interesting and very great question. Um, I will move on to Rumana. Maybe, Rumana, you can share something about how we can scale up innovations, especially climate information services further, not just in Bangladesh, but other countries within Southeast Asia or Africa? Yeah, thank you, Donna. So um, uh, I, I agree with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Rama and uh, the other speakers as well that uh, on this, uh, the scaling uh, measures or procedures should be uh, context specific and it will vary from region to region because uh, it, it varies, uh, it varies and um, in line with the systems as well uh, from region to region. So what I would like to focus on, uh, particularly focusing on climate information services work, uh, we need to focus, uh, we need to involve the private sector partners uh, because uh, this new approach of involving private, private sector partners has the potential uh, to make the innovations uh, self-sustainable. Uh, because we know that we, we have been working on a specific innovation or a specific uh, 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 adaptation approach uh, uh, under a specific project. And after the, when the project ends, and we cannot uh, contribute more on this. But if we uh, involve the private sector partners, I think uh, uh, it will be um, self-sustainable, that specific measure. And also, uh, uh, yeah, it... it they can scale it from uh, from one place to another uh, yeah, based on the uh, need of that specific approach or innovation. Yeah, thank you, Zana. Thank you, Ruana. And we also have another question around climate information services, uh, where they could be, be, be available and uh, how they can be accessed. Okay, the, uh, the service we have developed, it is available, it is a web-based platform at this moment. So it is available at advisely.com uh, and uh, it is free at this moment. And uh, we are trying to involve the public, uh, sorry, private sector partners to, to take it forward uh, uh, when the project ends. So it, it, it is available at this moment uh, at free uh, cost uh, and it is web-based. Uh, the uh, the uh, you can uh, share the link or anyone can share the link uh, on the comment box. It is advisely.com. Yeah. Thank you, Romana. And yeah. we have another question in the Q&A pane. Uh, this age of gender equality, still most of the women from coastal villages are devoid of getting fish and protein as food. So what can be possible as a solution to make the family aware? I think this could go for Shakuntala if you want to take this question, how can we make coastal village families have more fish as part of their diets and protein? Thank you, Doina. Um, first, yes, I do, I do think co coastal communities themselves and the women of the household of, of coastal communities are well, of, are well aware and realize the importance of fish as food, as an important part of their diets. So I do not think it's an it's a it's a it's a, it's an it's an issue for women not and their family, families not knowing the importance of fish as an important and nutritious foods. What I do think is important though and needs much more work is that the resources that 
on which on which coastal communities depend the fisheries for the not only for food not only for nutrients but for their livelihoods and incomes that they, they that they need much more control and they must be given space for much more participation for the solutions and the engagement that they have within the whole sector and that the solutions that are put in place are also derived from the communities. They are not brought in from outside, for example, by the governments, by the, by the national governments or by others, but they are engaged from the very beginning in identifying the solutions and seeing how the solutions work for them, in assessing the, the, the benefits they get from the solutions and how solutions can be improved. So I, so I think it's much more, it's a much more cohesive and engaged participation of communities in all aspects of, uh, of fisheries and all the benefits, the multiple benefits that the fisheries sector have for, for these communities on the coasts. Thank you, Chef Puntala. And um, now we, we will have to close this Q&A session because the time is coming to an end for this event, but uh, we will answer the questions separately and send them as part of the uh, wrap up of the event afterwards. I would like to give the floor to our guests today because we were all World Fish staff, but we have a special guest Nicole Franz from FAO, a partner of ours for a long time. Um, hi, Nicole. Hello, Dorna. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, the floor is over to you to um, close the event. Thank you very much uh, to all of the speakers for sharing your valuable input on today's important discussion on gender inclusive innovations in aquatic food systems and for giving me the opportunity to join you. Um, it is certainly a challenge to do justice to the richness of the innovations that were presented by the speakers here today. Um, but I think there's a lot for all of us to, to take home. For example, Rama, who shared a number of pathways you know, that allowed how to avoid gender blindness that would perpetuate gender gaps. And I think also what we could see from the question and answers now, she illustrated how one way to tackle the gender gaps and the underlying gender barriers in and along fish value chains is, is this gender inclusive finance and technology, including, for example, through information, communication and technology. So this can clearly make a difference to ensure equal rights and access to services and markets. We then also heard from Persadi, who focused on, on gender sensitive climate smart digital information services for, for aquaculture in Bangladesh, in this case, reaching 10,000 people, uh, many of whom are women. So, so this again is another innovative example to show how women can get involved more directly in resource management and in having a voice in, in decision making. So that's another very important example. And it's great to hear that this is accessible for all. Anouk then took us to the, to the Pacific to share how to move the needle towards more inclusive governance using participatory action research and indigenous methods to develop these action plans. And, and it was pointed out by different speakers that obviously solutions need to be adapted to to the local context, but I think this was a very, um, very good illustration of how to take the local context into account to really drive change, which is crucial to ensure equal rights, access and control over resources, including in particular women and youth and also people with disabilities, as we heard. Um, back to Bangladesh, we heard Mohamed who talked about women-led climate resilient aquatic food production, as well as women-led businesses, and how both contribute to creating economic empowerment through decent employment that is really based on improved skills and knowledge and environmentally sustainable systems. And how importantly, all of these have contributed to improving the, the social relationships and, and the norms in, in those uh, communities. 
So from all of this, I think it is very clear that fisheries cannot be understood without considering gender. And considering gender in the sector requires confronting the persistent absence of women in the already meager data available on small scale fisheries. And we also heard about that. As mentioned already by Rama, FAO is working with World Fish and Duke University on the Illuminating Hidden Harvest Study to help tackling that. And the findings confirm, in fact, that for every 10 people that participate in small scale fisheries, four are women, mostly in post harvest, but not only. This study also illustrates what we heard about here today, that traditionally women are usually overrepresented in rarely accounted for fishing labor, especially in the informal and the unpaid activities and in informal activities that support fishing businesses and operations. Similarly, women are usually underrepresented in governance arenas and face significant barriers to meaningful participation and management and decision making. All of this often results, in fact, in a situation where women, and especially certain groups of women, have less access to and stand disproportionately receiving benefits from small scale fisheries, especially income and nutrition related benefits, as was also clear from the questions we heard now. But we also heard here what can be done about this. And I would like to take the opportunity to remind all of you that 2022 is the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. And centralizing the role women play in small-scale artisanal fisheries and aquaculture is essential to women's empowerment and sustainable development. So let's all work together to make it a turning point for food system transformation, especially in scaling up and financing gender-inclusive innovations in aquatic food systems. Everyone can take action this year by organizing events, by launching studies, hosting exhibitions, and much more to support gender inclusive innovations in these aquatic food systems. For example, Norway, together with other partners, today is launching um, a, a webinar series for this international year uh, that will focus on gender and small scale fisheries. The initial event today will focus on the perspective from African small scale fisheries and you can see the link in the chat box on how to join the webinar. And there will be another event led by FAO to celebrate women in fisheries in Oman. So that's a, a, a way to share what is happening on the ground uh, in that country. Much more is happening to celebrate the International Year and I invite you to have a look at our IAFA events page for more inspiration. But more importantly, I invite you to organize activities yourself so that we don't miss the opportunity to achieve gender equality today for sustainable tomorrow by ensuring equal voice and decision-making power, equal rights, access and control over resources, equal rights and access to services, markets and decent work, and the reduction of women's work burden. In conclusion, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank World Fish for leading and organizing this event and to all of our wonderful partners for their support. And thank you, the attendees, for active, actively participating in today's virtual session. We hope you have gained something useful from our discussions. Before you go, we also invite you to subscribe to World Fish newsletter to receive the event recording and other post-event materials. The link for that will be posted here in the chat box. Thank you very much and see you all very soon. Thank you.